I'd like to welcome all of you who have joined us uh, to this evening's event, which is part of Shakespeare in Sutton. And uh, my name is Zoe Toft and I'm chair of a charity called Folio Sutton Coldfield. Uh, we're a charity that supports the public library in Sutton Coldfield. And uh, we do that by putting on events that encourage footfall into our libraries here in Sutton. And we've got an event this coming Saturday, uh, which is Shakespeare Day, uh, where we will be hosting the display of an original first folio uh, in conjunction with the Every, uh, Everything to Everybody project, which is celebrating the Shakespeare Memorial Library that's held in Birmingham Library in the Central Library. Uh, so if you are anywhere near Sutton and uh, you'd like to come and see a first folio, uh, you're very welcome to come and join us on Saturday afternoon. Please uh, welcome Dr. Simon May this evening. Uh, Simon completed his doctoral studies at Jesus College, Oxford, and uh, he's now director at BOA, I'm going to say BOA Academy, but its full title is BOA Creative Digital and Performing Arts Academy, I think, isn't it, Simon? Uh, and I got to know Simon through one of his connections to Sutton Coldfield. He, he, he used to teach here. Um, so I'm really delighted and very excited to be able to bring uh, Dr. Simon May to talk this evening about the global stage of Shakespeare and his contemporaries. So please, if everyone can turn off their cameras, turn off their sound now, and uh, we'll hand over to Simon. Thanks very much. Right, thank, thanks very much, Zoe, and good evening, everybody. And, and thank you so much for taking the time um, to attend this event, which obviously forms just a really small part of the fantastic um, Shakespeare in Sutton, Sutton um, Festival that's been organised by Folio Sutton Coldfield. Um, I've had a bit of an intro there um, from Zoe, but I'll just quickly allow you to put a, a face to the name before I turn my camera off um, as well, just to, to remove one extra distraction as I try to focus on discussing this wide range of plays, um, whilst also wor working a PowerPoint presentation on Zoom, which is kind of bringing back some of those skills that have perhaps drifted from my memory um, a little bit. Um, as Zoe mentioned, my academic background um, lies in early modern drama, um, more particularly the representation of monarchy in the plays of Christopher Marlowe, about whom you'll be hearing a little um, this evening. I completed my doctorate on that topic, but I've since gone into secondary school teaching uh, with several years spent at, at schools in Sutton Coldfield. I was very glad to be invited um, to speak to you this evening because it gives me the opportunity to contextualize some of the plays that many of us will know really very well, whether it be from school, from trips to the RSC or the Globe, or simply because some plays by Shakespeare are familiar to us, regardless of whether or not we've read or seen them. But what we can sometimes overlook is the question of how a play such as Shakespeare's Othello functions as part of a much broader cultural moment. And that's what I'm really wanting to try to explore with you um, this evening. Um, so let's get let's get started. So in terms of that, um, I'll be looking at when I say it, a text forms part of a broader cultural moment. What do I mean by that? Um, it might involve um, other texts, um, so other plays certainly, but it could also include things like um, travel writing, sermons, um, news and gossip, the circulation of popular print images, um, as well as up-to-date debates and philosophical um, discussions around ideas, including geopolitics, uh, immigration, ideal forms of government, and so on. And what I'm going to try to do tonight is to give you a flavor of how our understanding of the plays that were performed at the Globe Theatre can be enhanced when we pay careful attention to the world around those texts. That's obviously quite a lofty aim um, for the time available to me um, this evening. Um, so um, I should get started. But first of all, I'd just like to give credit to Dr. Peter Sutton of Jesus College Oxford, who worked um, closely with me in putting together the content of this evening's talk. Um, we were jointly responsible last year for the planning and the scripting of an event that celebrated the 450th anniversary of the foundation of Jesus College, or to use its full name, Jesus College in the University of Oxford of Queen Elizabeth's Foundation. Though Elizabeth I's true involvement was somewhat negligible, the cost and effort borne mostly by the Welsh lawyer Hugh Price, Jesus College stands uniquely as the only college to have been founded at Oxford during Elizabeth's reign of 1558 to 1603. And that's the period in which London saw the arrival of public theatres and the first wave of English Renaissance drama. Inspired by that coincidence, 
the initial plan for the event was to present a series of live performances of extracts from Elizabethan, but also some Jacobean and some Caroline plays to illustrate how playwrights and their audiences perceived their world circa the college's foundation. The, the selection of extracts um, soon expanded, however, to feature other texts focused on um, travel with historical commentary added to the performances of student actors in the form of short lectures and textual synopses. And tonight, I'm really very pleased to be able to share some of these student performances with you, um, primar primarily because they're recordings of plays that are now very rarely seen on the professional stage, um, but also because they'll provide you with some respite from my own voice. So to begin, what do I mean by the global stage? Um, at one level, of course, I'm punning on the name of London's uh, most famous theatre, um, but there is a convincing case to be made that early modern audiences looked upon the theatre as a place where they could make sense of their world. Inspired by the voyages of famous noblemen and the growth in global trade, playwrights in Shakespeare's era responded to and helped to perpetuate the public's desire for gripping stories involving travel and adventure, encounters with new peoples, and the discovery of exotic new locations. But drama offered far more than mere escapism for those unable to leave London. The plays of this period captured a world that was changing, with writers and their audiences more informed than ever about places and events overseas. The commonplace metaphor that I'm sure many of us are familiar with, describing the world as a stage, the actual Mundi, um, was long in circulation by the time Shakespeare came to use it most famously in the Seven Ages speech um, of the exiled nobleman Jacobus in As You Like It. Indeed, Shakespeare himself had used the same metaphor in an earlier comedy, The Merchant of Venice, while the motto of the Globe Theatre, built in 1599, was totus mundus agit histrionem, all the world's a playhouse. Though the metaphor is employed sardonically in As You Like It as a means to um, denigrate the value of life, all the world's a stage, he says, and all the men and women merely players, the prevalence of that comparison at the end of the 16th century, when the first professional playhouse had only opened its doors as recently as 1576, highlights that central importance that the theatre soon came to hold in early modern society, providing a shared experience through which playgoers could reflect upon the nature of their lives and the circumstances in which they lived. And just as playwrights looked to the material conditions of their own profession when describing the world, figuring it as in The Merchant of Venice as a stage where every man must play a part, they could equally harness the theatre's potential as a means of travel, transporting audiences to many different places, both real and imaginary, far beyond the lived experience of the average playgoer. So whether it be to, to Persia or to Indonesia, as we'll find in a few of my later examples today, or to Sutton Coldfield, of course, in Shakespeare's Henry IV Part Two, theatrical journeys of any kind um, depended, of course, upon some imaginative investment from the audience, as illustrated by the repeated entreaties of the chorus in Shakespeare's Henry V that playgoers use their imaginary forces, their thoughts and their minds to compensate for the, the limitations of the stage, the unworthy scaffold. But playwrights could also look to a thriving trade um, in travel literature and the publication of the first modern atlases, one of them you can see right now, um, for the information and the evocative detail they required to conjure disparate locations. They could rely upon their audiences to be well-informed on current affairs abroad, and they could reference, develop, even steal material from other plays of the period with foreign settings. On screen now in front of you um, is a page from Abraham Ortelius's landmark 1570 atlas, the Atrum Orbis Terrarum, the theatre of the orb of the world. We know that Christopher Marlowe, a contemporary of Shakespeare, owned or at least had access to a copy of this atlas because a journey through Africa described in one of his plays, follows the place names exactly as they're written um, in one of the maps, including the mistakes in Ortelius's um, version. And here is another map, um, this time from the 
1600 edition of Richard Hacklett's Principal Navigations, Voyages, Traffics and Discoveries of the English Nation, um, snappily titled. Um, and it's believed that this particular map, using as it does the, the lines of the Mercator projection, hopefully you can see those on your screen, inspired a line in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Um, he says, uh, he does smile his face into more lines than is in the new map with the augmentation of the Indies. So playwrights were definitely looking at maps, um, though principal navigations is not actually an atlas. It just contains this map um, to go with all of the travel narratives that it includes. Published in two editions at the end of the 16th century, um, Principal Navigations is an exhaustive collection of first-hand accounts of overseas expeditions. Uh, Hacklett himself was not well-traveled. Paris was in fact the only place that he visited outside of England. And he instead took the role of editor and translator, compiling a vast number of different travel narratives to provide the most up-to-date and comprehensive guide to the world that was then possible. Um, in the passage that I'm about to to show you, which is by far the longest I'll be reading out, but which I think does need to be read out in full. Um, Giovanni di Verrazzano, a Florentine employed in 1524 um, to explore the east coast of North America by the French King Francis I, describes a passing encounter that illustrates the curiosity, but also the pre-existing assumptions of European explorers regarding the people they met on their travels. And here it is. We saw there many people which came onto the shore, making diverse signs of friendship and showing that they were content we should come a land. And by trial, we found them to be very courteous and gentle, as your majesty shall understand. To the intent we might send them of our things, which the Indians commonly desire and esteem, as sheets of paper, glasses, bells, and such like trifles, we sent a young man, one of our mariners, ashore, who swimming towards them, and being within three or four yards of the shore, not trusting them, cast the things upon the shore. But seeking afterwards to return, he was with such violence of the waves beaten upon the shore that he was so bruised that he lay there almost dead, which the Indians perceiving ran to catch him and drawing him out, they carried him a little off from the sea. The young man perceiving they carried him, being at the first dismayed, began then greatly to fear and cried out piteously. Likewise did the Indians which did accompany him going about to cheer him and to give him courage, and then setting him on the ground at the foot of a little hill against the sun, they began to behold him with great admiration, marvelling at the whiteness of his flesh, and putting off his clothes, they made him warm at a great fire, not without our great fear, which remained in the boat, that they would have roasted him at that fire and have eaten him. The young man, having recovered his strength, and having stayed a little while with them, showed them by signs that he was desirous to return to the ship, and they with great love, clapping him fast about with many embracings, accompanying him unto the sea, and to put him in more assurance, leaving him alone, went unto a high ground and stood there, beholding him until he was entered into the boat. This young man observed, as we did also, that these were of colour inclining to black as the others were, with their flesh very shining, of mean stature, handsome visage, and delicate limbs, and of very little strength, but of prompt wit. Father, we observed not. Though left unspoken in this extract from Hacklett's Principal Navigations, an underlying prejudice in European travel writing rests on the point of religious difference. And the mission of spreading Christianity also served as a justification for the project of colonialism. In one of his most famous poems, um, John Donne um, erotically described his mistress as an America that he was blessed for discovering. Um, but later in life, now speaking as an Anglican priest, he expressed the converse view, arguing that the blessing should travel actually in the opposite direction, that is, to America from Europe in the form of religious conversion, which Dunn believed to be the morally correct course of action per se, but also to be a necessary uh, material precondition for the success of the North American plantations. Arguing to this effect, the passage uh, now on screen is taken from Dunn's sermon to the Virginia Company of London, delivered on the 13th of November, 1622. Dunn here is criticizing merchants for placing their primary focus on selling material goods when they could be spreading Christianity. Oh, if you could once bring a catechism to be as good wear amongst them as a bugle, as a knife, as a hatchet. Oh, if you would be 
that's ready to hearken at the return of a ship, how many Indians were converted to Christ Jesus as what trees or drugs or dyes that ship had brought, then you were in your right way and not till then. Conversion and the presumed superiority of the European perspective on religious truth is also a major theme in our first dramatic text, John Fletcher's The Island Princess, which dates from the same period as Dunn's sermon. When Shakespeare retired back to Stratford-upon-Avon at the end of his career, it was Fletcher who assumed the mantle as the house dramatist of the King's Men. Fletcher was no unknown quantity, having co-written Henry VIII and the two noble kinsmen with his illustrious predecessor. He had also written a sequel to The Taming of the Shrew, in which the tables are turned on, by Petru on Petruchio by his second wife, Maria, and he would go on to write a response to The Tempest in his travel comedy, The Sea Voyage. In The Island Princess, the, the romance of travel, in this case to Indonesia, is likewise recognised, albeit mixed with colonial self-justification. In the heartbreaking scene that we will see performed uh, by student actors in just a moment, um, Pizarra, the island princess, believes she has found true happiness with the Portuguese colonizing soldier Armusia, having been courted by a series of vainglorious local rulers earlier in the play. But as these final lines from the scene illustrate, his love turns out not to be as unconditional um, as she believes it to be. Having been asked to convert to Kisara's religion, um, his mood shifts instantaneously um, as Armusia responds with a tirade that uh, disparages the religious practices of his hostess. You might have seen some of the lines there on the screen, but what I'm going to do now is hopefully show you a video of this being performed um, over Zoom um, by some of the student actors. Um, let's see if it will play for us. Madam. You see, there's nothing I can reach at, either in my obedience or my service, that may deserve your love or win a liking. But a poor thought, but I pursue it seriously. I study new humility to please you and to end of joy in my afflictions. I dare believe your worth without additions, but since you are so liberal of your love, sir, and would be father tried, I do intend it, because you shall not or would not win me at such an easy rate. I am prepared still, and, and if I shrink- I know ye are no coward. This is the utmost trial of your constancy. And if you stand fast now, I am yours, your wife, sir. You hold, there's nothing dear that may achieve me, doubted or dangerous. There's nothing, nothing. L let me but know that I may straight fly to it. I'll tell you then. Change your religion, to be of one belief with me. How? Mark, worship our gods. Renounce that faith that you are bred in. It is easily done. I'll teach you suddenly and humbly on oh, your knees. I'll be hanged first. Offer as we do. To the devil, lady. Offer to him I hate. I know the devil. To dogs and cats, you make offer to them. To every bird that flies and every worm. How terribly I shake. Is this the trial, the great venture that you spoke of? Where have I been? And how forgot myself, how lost my memory? When did I pray or look up steadfastly? Had any goodness in my heart to guide me that I should give this vantage to mine enemy, the enemy to my peace? Forsake my faith. Come, come, I know ye love me. <laughs> love ye this way, this most destroying way. Sure you but jest, lady. I looked, ye should have said, make me a Christian. Work that great cure, for tis a great one, woman. That venture truly do perform, the crown of all great trial and the fairest. I looked, ye should have wept and kneeled to beg it washed off the mist of your ignorance with waters pure and repentant from those eyes. I looked you should have brought me your chief God you worship, he that you offer humane blood and life to and made a sacrifice of him to memory, beat down his altars, ruined his false temples. Okay, there we go. Thank goodness um, I managed to get it to play. Um, as you can see, it, it really brings to life 
um, these texts. And as, as I mentioned, many of them um, are not professionally um, performed today. We've got more of those um, to come. In a moment, I will be um, shifting focus from religion to the military conflicts um, that occurred elsewhere in the world, but which found their way onto the London stage in some of the most um, popular plays of the era. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce one more dramatic text that mixes travel, and in this case, um, global trade with evangelism. This extract is also a little out of the ordinary um, because it's not drawn from the professional theater. It instead formed part of the elaborate street pageantry that accompanied the installation of a new Lord Mayor of London, Sir Peter Proby, um, following his election in 1622. Written by Thomas Middleton, the triumphs of honor and virtue employs many of the same arguments that were used later in the same year by John Donne in the Virginia Colony Sermon, perpetuating racist associations regarding skin color and justifying colonialism as a form of blessing that was bestowed by Europeans, taking trade and Christianity to an indigenous population that is presented as entirely grateful for the change in circumstance. In these lines, a queen representing India claims that her material wealth, the riches and the sweetness of the East, um, pales in comparison with the Christian holiness, the celestial knowledge brought to her by English merchants. When, of course, what this extract really communicates is not the true voice of the colonized, but the projected ventriloquized language of colonial self-justification. At that point, however, I'm going to move now from religion, like I say, um, to look more at some of the conflicts that are taking place at different parts of the world during the careers of Shakespeare and his contemporaries to see how they are reflected in the drama. So here we go. In the late 16th century, um, despite their own plans for colonial expansion, European states, and especially those bordering the Mediterranean, um, were incredibly fearful of the military threat posed by the Ottoman Empire, which is, was centered in what would be modern day Turkey. When the Ottoman Navy lost a battle in the Gulf of Patras near to the port of Lepanto in 1571, as illustrated here, a celebratory mood swept the continent. Richard Knowles's General History of the Turks records that rejoicing was made in Rome, in Spain, Naples, Sicily and Malta, and that afterwards in other countries further off with like rejoicing and signs of joy, as with us here in England. Whilst in the Lepanto, a heroic poem composed by James VI of Scotland, the future King of England, the same event um, is described as a wondrous work of God. Never mind that the Ottomans saw their defeat at this battle at Lepanto as only a minor setback compared to their permanent capture of Cyprus, which, with Knowles recording that, quote, one of the chief prisoners of the Turks described the defeat at Lepanto as if a man should shave his beard, which would ere long grow again, but that the loss of Cyprus was unto the Venetians as the loss of an arm, which once cut off could never be again recovered. So far as popular opinion was concerned, at least, despite this perspective from the Ottomans, any victory was evidently to be celebrated as a triumph for Christendom against its greatest existential threat, and the bigger picture was studiously forgotten. In Tamburlaine the Great, um, Christopher Marlowe reflects upon these geopolitical concerns. First performed in 1587, the play presents the story of a poor Scythian shepherd who conquers kings and emperors to establish his own far-reaching empire. Though the narrative is based loosely on events from the 14th century, the sight of the hero resting control of the Persian empire before embarking on a war against the Turks would remind an Elizabethan audience of their own time, as the Ottoman Turkish empire was likewise embroiled in a war against Safavid Persia. In the following scene, which again we'll hear performed, the Turkish emperor Bajazeth addresses his wife Zabina, lamenting his defeat at the hands of Tamburlaine. And whilst remaining hopeful of a comeback, Bajazeth is only too aware of the relief that will be felt in Europe. But perhaps the audience should be careful not to celebrate too soon, because Europe is shown not to have saved itself from Turkish invasion, but relied upon the strength of another warlord, who it soon turns out has aspirations of his own. Ah, oh, fair Zabina, we have lost the field. And never had the Turkish emperor so great a foil by any foreign foe. 
now will the Christian miscreants be glad, ringing with joy their superstitious spells and making bonfires for my overthrow. But ere I die, those foul idolaters shall make me bonfires with their filthy bones. For Though the glory of this day be lost, African Greece have garrisons enough to make me sovereign of the earth again. <laughs> Those walled garrisons will I subdue and write myself great lord of Africa. So from the east unto the furthest west shall Tamburlaine extend his puissant arm the galleys and those pilling brigandines that yearly sail to the Venetian Gulf and hover in the straits for Christian's rack shall lie at anchor in Isle of Sant. Until the Persian fleets and men of war be sailing along the Oriental Sea have fetched about the Indian continent. Even from Persepolis to to Mexico, and thence unto the Straits of Gibraltar, where the two shall meet and join force in one, keeping in awe the Bay of Port and Gale, and all the oceans by the British shore. By this means I'll win the world at last. In this passage, as we've just heard, Tamburlaine counters Bajazeth by outlining his own intended territorial gains and dreams of naval supremacy. And given what we know about Marley's access to that 1570 atlas of Abraham or Tellius, when Tamburlaine refers to the Gulf of Venice and Zakynthos, the Isle of Sant, um, and promises to send the Persian fleet from Persepolis to Mexico, and thence to consolidate power in the Bay of Biscay northwards to the British shore, it should be clear that the world that he's expecting to win is not abstract or unknown, but cartographically accurate, which perhaps makes the certainty with which he expresses his plans all the more frightening. Turning now from the Near East to North Africa, while Marlowe chose for his subject matter the distant past as a means to pass oblique comment on the present, some Elizabethan plays uh, are notable for exploring recent events far more directly. Minus the Cloak of Allegory. George Peel's The Battle of Alcazar, um, which you can now see an extract from on screen, um, is a case in point. Dramatising as it does, the Battle of Alcazar Kabir, otherwise known as the Battle of Three Kings, which took place in Morocco in 1578, only a decade or so before Peel wrote the play. The battle saw the deposed Sultan of Morocco, um, Abu Abdallah Mohammed II, known in the play as Muli Mohammed, and his Portuguese allies, King Sebastian I, attempt to wrest back control of the Moroccan throne from the new Sultan, Abd al-Malik, known in the play as Abd al-Malik. The battle resulted in the death of all three kings, causing a succession crisis in Portugal that led in turn to a 60-year dynastic union with Spain, because there were simply um, no candidates um, for the Portuguese throne left. Peel presents this disastrous outcome for the Portuguese as largely the result of political naivety. Sebastian is the play's most admirable character. You can see here he's saying that I'm fully resolute to fight and who re refuseth now to follow me, let me be ever counted cowardly. So he seems admirable, but this virtue is also his greatest weakness as it allows Muli Mohammed, who turns out to be the primary villain, um, to exploit Sebastian's good intentions and those of his followers, followers with almost comical ease. As you can see from the lines here on screen, Sebastian, the Duke of Aveiro, and Thomas Stukeley, a famous Elizabethan adventurer and the subject of several other adventure plays, all pledge to fight for Muli Mohammed to return the throne to him. But once he's left alone on stage, Muli Mohammed reveals via soliloquy directly to the audience, so we're, we're complicit in these plans. He explains that he's merely using the Christians to achieve his own ends. He says, now have I set these Portugals a work to hew away for me unto the crown, or with their weapons here to dig their graves. Naivety 
makes for good drama, of course, and early modern playwrights were alive to the self-delusions that underlay many projects overseas. The stories they presented on stage might at times flatter English theatre goers with a sense of their nation's capacity for exploration and conquest, not least when that involved victories over Spain, but they could also reveal the limits of English understanding, military might and influence in the world. And whilst they could perpetuate damaging stereotypes, they were also able to highlight the accompanying hypocrisies of English or European exception exceptionalism. One character, and I'm shifting now from conflict to trade, one character who is completely deluded about his own power to accumulate the riches of the world is the aptly named Sir Epicure Mammon, one of Ben Jonson's most delightfully grotesque characterizations uh, from The Alchemist of 1610. Written in the context of a deadly return of the plague, Johnson understood that we turn to material comforts during times of profound worry and uncertainty. And in the case of Sir Epicure Mammon, the desire for such comfort is taken to an extreme that reflects nonetheless the increasing availability of luxury goods from around the world in London's shops. We've already heard Marlowe's terrifying conqueror Tamburlaine outline his ambitions for global conquest. And here we are presented with a deft parody that maintains the same linguistic bombast, but where the object of desire has shifted, for, has shifted from territorial gains made on the battlefield to goods that can be bought in the shopping mall. But how will Sir Epicure realize these material ambitions? Johnson recognized something else about human behavior during a time of plague. Where there is fear, there is vulnerability and a vulnerable society is a con man's dream. Speaking as he enters the somewhat um, dingy Blackfriars property of the supposed alchemists, Sir Epicure believes the world will soon be at his feet once he has procured for himself the philosopher's stone. In the passage on screen, he expresses his hope to be soon eating meat served in Indian shells and to be wearing shirts of such rich color as to provoke the Persian. Um, but we'll now hear the full speech to appreciate the global reach um, of his desires. He wants things from all around the world um, to improve his condition. So again, let's have a look at a, a performance of this section. Come on, sir, come on. Now, you set your foot on shore in Novo Orbe. <laughs> Here is the rich Peru, and there within, sir, are the golden mines. Great Solomon's up there. I do mean to have a list of uh, wives and concubines equal with Solomon, who had the, the stone alike with me. <laughs> My flatterer shall be the pure and gravest of the vines that I can get for money. My mere fools, elegant burgesses. And in my poets, the same that read so subtly of the fart, <laughs> whom I shall entertain still for that subject. <laughs> my meat shall all come in, in Indian shells, dishes of a guard set in gold and studded with emeralds, sapphires, hyacinths, and rubies. The tongues of carps, Dormice and camel's heels boiled in the spirit of soul and dissolved pearl. And I shall eat these broths with spoons of amber, headed with diamond and carbuncle. My footboy shall eat pheasants, calvert salmons, not godwit's lamprey. I myself shall have the, the beards of barbell served instead of salads oiled mushrooms and the swelling unctuous paps of a fat pregnant sow newly cut off dressed in an exquisite and poignant sauce for which i shall say unto my cook there be gold go forth and be a nice my shirts i'll have of taffeta sarsenet soft and light as cobwebs, and for all my other raiment, it shall be such as might provoke the Persian were he to teach the world riot anew. My gloves of bird and fish skins, perfumed with 
gums of paradise and eastern airs. I, I do think to have all of this with the stone. Mercantile business and the, the birth of consumer culture were clearly a major focus for Johnson. In the, the entertainment at Britain's Burst, a mask that was composed for the opening of the New Exchange Shopping Mall in 1609, and which was only rediscovered as a Johnson play in the 1990s, uh, a shop boy and his master enumerate, enumerate the many fine products imported from China. Um, Johnson's characteristic deployment of extensive listing, which we also just heard in Sir Epicure's speech, creates an almost absurd sense of the abundance of products um, from throughout the world that shoppers can buy. Cabinets that you can scarcely fathom yet weigh but 18 ounces, avoir du poire, voiders for your table that have the true recipe of the Turkish varnish, carpets wrought of parakeetos feathers, umbrellas made of the wing of the Indian butterfly, and so on. There's a big long list there of all these different goods that are available um, in London shops should you want to buy them. With equal precision, Barabbas's opening soliloquy in Marlowe's The Jew of Malta portrays the Mediterranean and Malta especially um, as a point of convergence for the transport of goods and payment, uh, with a sense of abundance generated again by the references to so many place names and peoples, and by the listing of precious items that apparently exist in surplus beyond Europe. As money exchanges hands for products from throughout the world at Britain's Burst, so traders and merchants in Marlowe's play um, throughout the supply chain complete transaction after transaction with gold allowing access across cultural and linguistic barriers. And with this, there is the implication that traditional hierarchies are in the process of being supplanted as new trading networks shift control from monarchs to merchants. Since it is now the latter, as you can see at the very bottom of the slide now, it is now merchants who have the means to ransom great kings from captivity owing to their wealth from trade. Here is a fuller version of that opening soliloquy for you to enjoy. And again, listen out for all of that listing of all those goods from around the world that are now seen to be available um, in England, or in this case, of course, in the play in Malta. To that of thus much, that return was made. And of the third part of the Persian ships, there was the venture summed and satisfied. As for those Samnites, the men of us that bought my Spanish oils and wines of Greece. Here have I pursed their paltry silverlings. Fine, what a trouble tis to count this trash. Well fared the Arabians, who so richly pay the things they traffic for with wedge of gold, whereof a man may easily in a day tell that which may maintain him all his life. The needy groom that never fingered groat would make a miracle of thus much coin. But he who still barred coffers are crammed full, and all his lifetime hath been tired, wearying his fingers' ends with telling it, would in his age be loath to labor so, and for a pound to sweat himself to death. Give me the merchants of the Indian mines that trade in metal of the purest mold. The wealthy Moor that in the Eastern rocks without control can pick his riches up and in his house keep pearl like pebble stones. Receive them free and sell them by the weight. Bags of fiery opals, sapphire. Amethysts, oh, jacinths, hard topaz, grass green emeralds, beauteous rubies, sparkling diamonds, and seldom costly stones of so great price as one of them, indifferently rated and of a carat of this quantity, may serve in peril of calamity to ransom great kings from captivity. This is the where wherein consists my wealth, and thus, methink, should men of judgment frame their means of traffic from the vulgar trade. And as their wealth increaseth, 
so enclose infinite riches in a little room. As trade increased throughout the early modern era, so did its presence in drama. In Shakespeare's The Comedy of Errors, for instance, uh, the plot and comedic effect of the play is entirely dependent on what is bought and sold and by whom. This, of course, is a theme that Shakespeare would return to with darker resonances in The Merchant of Venice, when the supposed neutrality of mercantile transaction is set alongside explicit racism and anti-Semitism. Shakespeare's nuanced presentation of Shylock is in contrast to the cartoonish villain of Marlowe's Barabbas in The Jew of Malta. But like Shakespeare, Marlowe makes us understand how the system is biased against the Jewish community, with Barabbas's outlandish, ruthless scheming explained, at least in part, as a reaction to the unwarranted state seizure of Jewish property. It's a measure that is ostensibly taken to raise funds to safeguard Malta from invasion, but it's conspicuous in its targeted impact on a religious minority. On screen now is a very popular print image that circulated widely at the end of the 16th century. And this illustrates another example of religious persecution. It depicts the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572, which began in Paris and then spread throughout um, the rest of France, targeting the Huguenots, a group of Protestants, and leading to the arrival of many refugees um, looking for sanctuary in Protestant England. Print images like this one, news pamphlets, and Marlowe's historical drama, The Massacre at Paris, ensured that the, the horrors of persecution were well known. But such a global awareness did not preclude or eliminate shameful acts of xenophobia, with the religious fugitives subject in England, nevertheless, to a climate of intolerance and grotesque intimidation. On the 5th of May, 1593, a 53-line poem um, nailed, was nailed to the wall of the Dutch church on London's Broad Street. Um, this dog wall verse is known today as the Dutch church libel, and it was probably the work of Thomas Deloney, though it wasn't um, signed with his name. Um, and it was an explicit call for violence against the Dutch and French Protestants who were living in the area, many of them refugees, or at least the descendants of refugees from the religious wars in Europe. The poem addressed its intended victims directly, um, complaining about the impact of their arrival on English livelihoods, um, employing the anti-Semitic trope of the blood libel, and threatening bloodshed in the most gruesome terms imaginable. Understandably, I've quoted very selectively from the poem, um, but the few lines that you can see on screen will give you a sense of its co content and its tone, not least from the insensitive reference there to the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre and the, the, the promise that the violence in London will outstrip it. It's unsettling, I think, to realize when we're looking at poems and, and drama in most of this talk, to realize that the threats here in the Dutch church libel were not meant rhetorically, nor were they safely contained within the fiction of a stage play. They were meant in earnest. And it's within this hostile context that our next play was written. The biographical drama, Sir Thomas More, is the work of several playwrights, um, Henry Chettle and Anthony Munday were believed to have originally composed the play, with later revisions carried out by Thomas Decker, Thomas Hayward, and William Shakespeare. And it's from Shakespeare's contribution that you'll be hearing um, shortly. In this part of the play, in Shakespeare's part of the play, our attention is drawn to an incident from May Day 1517 that involves the title character in his then capacity as an under-sheriff in the City of London, attempting to quell a mob of rioting apprentices. An expression of the anti-immigrant resentments that was felt towards Flemish workers in London, the May Day riot had been stirred by a xenophobic speech um, delivered publicly on the grounds of St Paul's um, Cathedral. Foreigners' houses were looted as a result, around 300 arrests were made and 14 people were executed. In this scene, Moore appeals to the rioters' better instincts in an effort to prevent further violence. And when it's viewed alongside the Dutch church libel, we might, we, might, we might well conclude that Shakespeare's contribution to the play was intended as more than simply a recreation of past events. Its call for compassion was in part also a rebuke to the anti-alien fervour of his own day.
as I'm sure you'll appreciate, it's a speech that still resonates today. And I'll play the, the full thing for you um, now, but allow you, first of all, to, to read these first four lines. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs with their poor luggage, plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you sit as king, kings in your desires. We'll now see how that speech continues. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs, and their poor luggage plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silent by your brawl, and you in rough of your opinions clothed. What have you got? I'll tell you. You had taught how insolence and strong hand should prevail, how order should be quelled, and by this pattern, not one of you should live an aged man. For other ruffians, as their fancies wrought with self same hand, self reasons and self right would shark on you, and men like ravenous fishes would feed on one another. You'll put down strangers, kill them, cut their throats, possess their houses, and lead the majesty of law in line to slip them like a hound. Say now the king, as he is clement, if the offender mourn, should so much come to short of your great trespass as but to banish you, whither would you go? What country, by the nature of your error, should give you harbour? Go you to France or Flanders, to any German province, to Spain or Portugal, nay, anywhere that not adheres to England, why you must needs be strangers? Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth? Wet their detested knives against your throat, spurn you like dogs, and like as if that God owed not, nor made not you, nor that the claimants were not all appropriate to your comfort, but chartered unto them, what would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case, and this your mountainish inhumanity. Some of these brutal realities of life in early modern England, I'd like to finish this evening briefly with a few more whimsical examples from travel drama, um, albeit with the underlying recognition that even the most absurd journey or setting can encourage or was designed to encourage some serious reflection regarding the familiar world left behind. And indeed, it's, it's likely no coincidence that Sir Thomas More's Utopia, the title being a pun on the Greek for good place, but also no place, um, describes a faraway isle. And it's striking to note the professional treatment that was given to the mapping of this fictional island uh, by Abraham Ortelius. The image that you can see here from 1595 closely matches the level of detail that you see in the 1570 atlas that we looked at at the start. Building on his speech regarding the treatment of immigrants in London, Shakespeare famously further explored the experience of exile in The Tempest, where the depiction of an imaginary island like Utopia prompts the audience to reflect, prompts us to reflect upon our own society, to evaluate our own systems of government and claims to power, and to imagine a better world. The only shame is that Gonzalo's description of an ideal society um, falls down um, under the weight of its own contradictions. I'm going to show you now um, a section from it. Gonzalo imagines as king that he would, by con contraries, execute all things, for no kind of traffic would I admit, no name of magistrate, letters should not be known, riches, poverty, and use of service, none, contract, succession, born, bound of land, tithe, vineyard, none, no use of metal, corn, or wine, or oil, 
no occupation, all men idle, all and women too, but innocent and pure, no sovereignty. And of course, at that moment, um, he's picked up um, in the cynical commentary of Sebastian, suggesting that the, the ideal system of government will always remain out of reach. The good place will always be no place. Shakespeare in this speech um, is following um, a depiction in uh, Montaigne's essay of the cannibals. So it's drawing on, just like those extracts from Hacklet, um, on supposedly genuine observations about faraway places, but in a way that's actually linking back to what is society like in Europe? How could things change? How could they be different? The travel to a different place provides that opportunity to think about how the world might be reconstructed. Of course, in Shakespeare's handling, it's also comic because this serious minded reflection is placed in the language of somebody who is comical. And similarly, in Richard Brome's um, Caroline drama, The Antipodes, the genre of travel literature is spoofed through the mock presentation of a distant land where all things um, seem very different to how they are back at home. Peregrine, um, the character who is, uh, speaks first here in the extract, is a character whose obsession with travel has driven him to madness. The further he can travel, the better. Um, and this leads to a comic trip trick prescribed by the doctor um, who takes him to the most exotic place of all the antipodes of England. And of course, what that really means is that he doesn't travel anywhere um, at all. And in this location, all things are contrary. Peregrine in that first speech um, that you can see at the top left is thinking about and reflecting on some of the, 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 the fanciful descriptions of travelers like John Mandeville, uh, which might ring a bell for anyone who's read Othello and some of the descriptions of Othello about the people that he's encountered on his many journeys. And that's one of the ways in which he woos Desdemona. The doctor counters that by saying, no, no, that's not that far at all. That's not that impressive. Let me take you to the Antipodes of England. And now just moving down to the bottom left hand side um, of the slide, you'll see there he says, this is the Antipodes of England. The people there are contrary to us. The magistrates, gov here the magistrates govern the people. There the people rule the magistrates. Moving on, he says, um, by, uh, by, contrary, by the contraries to ours, where we hawk at pheasant, partridge, mallard, and so on, our hawks become their game, our game their hawks, and so the like in hunting. They keep their cats in cages, from mice they would devour them else, and so on. Leading up to that final point there, where it says that the, the, the merchants' wives do deal abroad beyond seas, while their husbands cuckled them at home. So there's that idea that everything has been turned um, on its head. But as in The Tempest, imagining the contrary helps to bring the familiar into sharper focus. Finally, from imaginary worlds to fanciful technology, my final extract is taken from The Travels of the Three English Brothers, written by John Day, William Rowley and George Wilkins. The play's narrative follows the real-life adventures of the three Shirley brothers, Thomas, Anthony and Robert, who in various ways and to varying degrees of success spent much of their lives trying to counter and frustrate the Ottoman Empire, whether it be through their privateering in the eastern Mediterranean or by travelling to Persia to advise Shah Abbas the Great on how to prepare the Safavid army. English interest in the Shirley brothers had been fostered by pamphlets telling their story, upon which the playwrights capitalised with this hastily written drama. The only downside to their topical subject matter was the lack of resolution that that brought. The brothers were still alive, so their stories were still ongoing, which may help to explain the ingenious use of an invented technology, the perspective glass, seen here in the final stage directions. If I read the stage directions, I'll then explain what's going on. Enter three several ways the three brothers, Robert with the state of Persia as before, Sir Anthony with the King of Spain and others where he receives the Order of Santiago and other offices, Sir Thomas in England with his father and others. Fame gives to each a perspective glass. They seem to see one another and offer to embrace, at which fame parts them, and so the play ends. So at this point at the end of the play, the three brothers are in three distant locations, and this invented means of communication, the perspective glass, allows them to communicate with one another, much in the manner, of course, um, of a Zoom meeting, before the play then concludes with the conventional round of applause. And I thought, given, given the remote nature um, of tonight's talk, this ending struck me as being a very fitting conclusion to our own dramatic journey across the global stage. I hope that 
some of the texts and contexts that I've discussed, albeit very briefly tonight, have been of interest to you and have drawn out some of the ways that early modern drama played its part in the discursive environment of early modern society, helping to make some of the perspectives that were held by writers and by their audiences on a range of topics um, that remain pertinent today. So thank you very much um, for attending. As Zoe said, if you do have any questions, please feel free um, to add them into the chat. Um, I'm going to put my microphone on to mute now for a few minutes and then I'll come back and I'll answer any questions as best I can. Uh, but likewise, do feel free to take this opportunity um, to enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you again for, um, for listening in and joining tonight's talk. So I think it just remains for me to say uh, thank you once again, Simon. Uh, I found this evening's talk really, really fascinating. And um, I'm sure on behalf of us all, we're all giving you a round of applause and um, wishing you a fair voyage, whatever you're going to do for, for the rest of your Easter holidays. So thank you. And uh, with that, I think we'll say good night to everybody and uh, hope to see you at another Shakespeare and Sutton event over the next 10 days or so. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank Bye. you.